Dinner time was quiet that night, the night everything was ruined. Of course the food was good, I know because I made it myself. Refried beans, eggs, and of course, the locally sourced burgers that were the backbone of this now broken family. I remember when everyone was happy, when they all still loved me, when they respected me. They used to appreciate the things I did to put food on the table and keep a roof over their heads. But it's not like that anymore. It hasn't been for a long time. I could see it in their eyes. They all hated living in my house. They hated my food. They hated me. They couldn't even pretend to hide it anymore. Those worthless kids just picked at their food, pushing it around their plates but never actually eating it. They wouldn't even take a single bite of the burgers I made. And it was a fresh batch. God, it was the most unbearable experience. Just sitting there in silence without even the sound of chewing if it weren't for Linda. At least that old ball and chain was still in it with me. We used to sit around the dinner table and tell jokes, laugh, make fun of each other, talk about random stupid stuff. But now it was just silence and those damn sirens. I can't stand them. It was like a car horn in my head every time. And it was really starting to mess with my head. I knew they could all tell too, which was just adding to the awkwardness. Finally, at some point I couldn't take it anymore. And I had a bit of an outburst. Why isn't anyone saying anything? Somebody just say something, please! Bobby, calm down, please. You're scaring the children. I don't care, Linda. This is my house, and I say if they're scared, then maybe they'll actually speak. Oh, come on, Bobby. Don't use that tone of voice at the dinner table. Not in front of the whole family. Save it up and use it on me later. Mm, fine. But only if we can do the thing. Of course. We're gonna do the thing. <laughs> <laughs> Ew, Mom! Dad! Not right in front of us! Be quiet, Jean. Eat your dinner. <clears throat> He's right. Let's just sit back down. Um, sorry everyone. What I should have done was dole out some real old-fashioned discipline. That would have knocked some sense into them. And then my loser son would have never had the chance to cause any trouble. I was too soft on him. I told him so many times that he better eat everything on his plate or he wasn't going to leave the table. But he would just whine and say something passive like, Wah, I'm trying, or, but I don't like it. What a disgrace. When did I raise such a backstabbing little brat? He even had the audacity to ask the forbidden question. The one thing nobody is ever supposed to ask. Dad, can we just eat something else for once? How dare you say that! Bobby, save it for the bedroom, remember? Shut up and eat! I don't want to hear it! All of you, this table better be completely cleared off in the next five minutes! I'm tired of sitting here! I finished half an hour ago! That punk was testing me, defying me in front of my whole family. The disrespect, challenging my authority like that. He was asking for hellfire to rain down on him. Gene, eat it! <sighs> Linda, Luis, Tina, eat faster! And you, Gene, look me in the eye. Look at me! Do I look like you want to mess with me? Then eat the food. I finally had him where I wanted him, listening to me and following orders. I was this close to squashing any and all talks related to eating something else once and for all. But then... I can't! That ungrateful snot stain took one little bite and spat it right out, and puked over all the food. He then ran away screaming and crying like a big giant baby. At the time, I didn't know what he was thinking. There was nowhere he could run to where I couldn't get him. He was trapped in my domain. I stormed up those stairs and right to his door, ready to break it down in a heartbeat. But for some stupid reason, I gave him one last chance to come willingly. Gene, open this door! Get away from me or I'm calling the cops! Now those are really the words no one's allowed to say in my house. And for good reason. I begged him not to do it. I really groveled and pleaded with the kid. I think it really shows how kind and understanding I can be. If you call the cops, I will personally grind you up and serve you all next week! Listen to me, you coward! I'll make sure you go in feet first so you have to suffer! It's too late, Dad! They're already on their way! I snatched the phone out of his hand and taught him a much-needed lesson. But it was already too late. My son had already turned into a snitch and ratted us out. The cops came and swarmed us before we had time to get rid of all the evidence. I still can't believe it. My own son called the cops on me, destroying everything I built. All because he was tired of eating human burgers every day. 
And because it was morally reprehensible and unforgivable to go around town kidnapping people and grinding them into burger meat so I could eat them and serve them on a sesame seed bun. Give me a break. Slaving away for Sir Topham Hat for decades. I have no life outside of serving humans, taking them from point A to point B and back again. Day and night, I only get time off from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. when there just aren't any passengers for a passenger train to serve. Sir Topham wants fares from the earliest commuters to the latest partiers every single day. I have to make sure I'm on time no matter what happens, or Sir Topham will punish me. I'm terribly afraid of him, so I do everything I can to avoid messing up. I have fellow locomotives, but we never get a second to talk to each other. As soon as we're on break, we pass out until the workers wake us up again. I haven't had a friend since 1984. Work became even harder when they blocked off the second tunnel. But it's not the increased workload that weighs on me. It's Henry. I haven't seen him in ages. Henry and I used to be best friends. From the very beginning, we became close because Sir Topham had had it out for us. I don't know why. Maybe it was because we were the lowest men on the totem pole or because we had the audacity to complain a bit too much. But either way, Henry and I had the most unforgiving schedule out of anybody. We ran routes all day and then we ran more at night. Nighttime was by far the worst part of our job. It wasn't just the constant berating from Mr. Topham or the unpaid overtime. Something weird would happen almost every night. There was this one really dark section of the tracks, halfway through the tunnel where we couldn't see anything at all. Mr. Topham never allowed us to have headlights because of budgetary constrictions, or whatever nonsense he was talking about. I never understood what it was at the time, but it always happened to me in the same spot. I would be rolling down the track at high speed, and then I'd hit a bump, or more like a soft wet thud beneath my wheel. When we got back to the station, the workers would quickly pull us aside and hose us down before anybody saw. This would happen to either me or Henry three or four times a week on a regular basis. We tried bringing this to the attention of Mr. Topham, but as usual, he didn't want to hear a word from us. He told us to keep quiet and not tell any of the other locomotives about the wet thuds in the tunnel, or he'd send us to the scrapyard. As time went on, Henry and I began to dread going through the tunnel. We had our suspicions about what those thuds could be, but we never knew for sure until one night. I was loading up passengers for my last ride out of the station that night when I saw Henry come out of the tunnel with a look on his face like he was about to throw up. I looked closer and saw something stuck to his grill, a baseball hat. Henry was shaking on his rails. <gasps> Sir Topham was next to him, telling him something I was too far away to hear, but it looked scary. That night, around 3 a.m., Henry woke all of us up to tell us something. He told us that he finally figured out what the source of all those wet thuds in the tunnel were. I didn't want to believe him, but I had to. I knew Henry wouldn't lie, and I knew he wasn't crazy. He had a plan to make sure it would never happen again, but he needed my help to make sure it worked. I promised him I would do it, but I was too scared. That morning, when the time came to do it, I couldn't work up the courage. Henry rolled back into his station, but right before he exited the tunnel, he slammed on the brakes. I was supposed to leave the station and go into the other tunnel so they would both be blocked. That way, no trains could go through. But I froze. I couldn't do it. The way Henry looked at me then, I'll never get it out of my head. I knew he would never forgive me for betraying him. A moment later, Sir Topham stormed up to Henry and started screaming at him. They went back and forth for a while, arguing over something. Henry, what are you doing? I'm not coming out of this tunnel until you take me off the night shift forever. Nonsense! I said you work nights, so you work nights! That's it! Final decision! Then you'll never move another passenger through this tunnel. My brakes are on and I'm not going anywhere. I'll die in here! Oh really? 
So be it. Seal off the tunnel! Wait, no, stop! I'll come out! It's too late now, Henry. You wouldn't run over an innocent man, would you? That's what I thought. The workers were just as under Sir Topham's control as us. They didn't bat an eye to bury Henry alive. Finally, I realized I had doomed my friend and tried to step in. Sir, please stop this. If you don't, I'll have to- Silence! If you think squatting in the other tunnel means I won't seal you in there too, then you're wrong! Now get going! We'll have you torn apart in the scrapyard! Yes, sir. Reluctantly, I did as I was told, and moved forward into the tunnel, taking one last look at my best friend Henry before that tunnel was forever sealed off at both ends by a brick wall. What makes it even worse is that I don't even know if Henry had any passengers aboard when he was trapped. Even if he did, I'm sure Sir Topham wouldn't have cared. Decades later, the wall still stands, and I still do Sir Topham's bidding. Ever since I saw what happened to Henry, I'm too afraid to defy him. Everyone is. The wall is a constant reminder that Henry is still in there, rotting away. I do my night runs like a good train every night, no matter what I run over in the tunnel. important person in my life. Everything I did and all my plans were centered around Nemo. Without Nemo, I was nothing and could do nothing. After my wife and kids were taken away from me by the Barracuda, Nemo was all I had left. My desires in life after that were simple. No matter how much I wanted it, nothing would bring my family back. So I focused on Nemo. For years it was just me and him. I guess you could say the isolation made me go a little crazy. But being a parent will do that too. All I wanted to do was get one single son or daughter of mine to reach adulthood, but it seemed like I was doomed to fail at that no matter what. I tried as hard as I could to keep Nemo safe, but despite all my efforts, one day, he disappeared. My fragile mental state was shattered all over again. I immediately went searching all across the ocean for him. I looked under every rock, inside every anemone, through every net full of fish. I chased after every boat, combed through every reef, and wailed into the abyss from every drop off. Nemo! But no matter where I looked, I couldn't find anyone. Sooner or later, my physical health degraded along with my mental health. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. I even forgot to breathe sometimes. I was so focused on the impossible task of finding Nemo. Eventually, I knew I didn't stand a chance of doing it on my own. So I sought help from others. Unfortunately, it seemed that every creature I encountered would rather eat me than help me. The crabs on the ocean floor just wanted to pick the flesh off my bones with their pincers. The sharks just wanted to swallow me whole with their putrid mouths full of all those teeth. There was no way I could take on any of those guys either. But even when I tried to talk to the sea turtles, who everyone says are supposed to be so wise, those lazy bums couldn't even tell their own flipper from a clump of kelp. And don't even get me started on the whales. Those guys are so big they didn't even notice I existed. For weeks I continued my search. I started having hallucinations of Nemo, which only added to my torment. I was ready to give up, to just let my body succumb to starvation. But then I saw her, the dumbest, most helpless fish I've ever seen. Yet somehow, I knew she was the one fish who could help me. Her name was Dory. In our first conversation, she forgot my name ten times. I soon learned that she was incapable of holding onto a single bit of information for more than 30 seconds. However, I was glad to meet her. I had the feeling that she would help me a lot, even if I never found Nemo. Dory could help me learn how to forget, and then one day, maybe I could move on with my life. Maybe even start over with a new family. The crazy thing was, once I stopped endlessly searching, I realized I was swimming in a giant circle the whole time. How stupid is that? That's when Dory said her and I weren't that different, and I knew she was right. I invited her to come home with me since she didn't have a family to go home to either. It was nice to finally have someone to talk to that didn't want to eat me or flat out ignore me. Even though she could never remember the last thing either one of us said, at least she had some semblance of who I was the whole time. She might never be able to remember my name, but there are perks to that actually. I didn't have any food in my house, but I had plenty of drinks. We shared what I could offer and talked about our lives all throughout the night. Unsurprisingly, a grieving father and a fish with severe short-term memory loss didn't take long to lose track of how much we were drinking. We got absolutely sloshed before we knew it. That's when I said something that I knew might be a mistake to admit. 
I... I have something to get off my chest. Please don't judge me too harshly. Nemo is dead. He's been dead the whole time. It's all my fault. I killed him. He, he wasn't doing anything wrong. He was just getting on my nerves every day. And then one day, I went into his room and saw him doing something that sent me over the edge. I grabbed a rock and... and... <laughs> it's okay, Martin. We all make mistakes. I'm proud of you for admitting what you did wrong. It takes a lot of strength. I just have one question. If he was dead this whole time, why did you go looking for him for so long? Because his body is gone. I buried him underneath his bed and I would beg for forgiveness at his grave every night. But one morning, he just wasn't there. Somebody stole the only thing I had left. That's not the only thing you have left, Marley. You got me now. It's Marlin. Right, Marlin. Let's go find your son. Thank you, Dory. Let's start at the scene of the crime. I showed Dory to Nemo's room. Then I let her go inside. I could tell she was afraid. She went inside slowly and cautiously, clearly very nervous about having her back turned to me. I told her I wouldn't hurt her and to keep going. She was scared out of her mind, but she listened. She crept up to the bed and looked underneath it, then froze. I knew what she was looking at. I'm the one who put it there. Nothing was there. There was no blood, no bits of rotting corpse, no worms, nothing but an empty, freshly dug hole. What am I looking at? Dory. Do you know what Nemo means in Latin? What? Do you know what Nemo means? No! It means nobody! <gasps> we were looking for nobody! Ah! I seized the opportunity and shoved her into the hole. I then started shoveling in the dirt. I couldn't believe how long it had been since there was a smile on my face. But it felt even better than I remember. 